Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to the interim results presentation from Luciko PLC for, uh, for 2020. Uh, slide three, if we can start with that, is a brief overview of the group. All of you will be familiar by now with who we are and what we do. I would just point out one aspect of this slide, which is that the wiring accessories business has had a very strong period and as a percentage of the group total has increased to 44% in the period. If we now move on to slide four, I will take you through the financial and other highlights of the period. So the revenue was 13.4% lower than last year, um, which in the end was a better performance than we were expecting in March. And throughout the period, improved so by the end of the second half was running about 90 percent of normal and since the end of the first half it has grown significantly in line with the diy consumer boom which has come about as uh, consumers have been spending more on their homes and not on going out or on their holidays the reduction in revenue however was more than offset by the record gross margins and the stringent overhead control so the gross margin in improvement was all the more impressive in the light of the weak demand, which was obviously a drag on the first half margins, but will reverse in the second half as the volumes improve. This resulted in operating profit 25% higher than last year at exactly £9 million. And adjusted free cash flow doubled to just over £10 million. Uh, operating cash conversion of more than 100% as the lower activity resulted in a reduction in working capital. The closing net debt of just over 22 million, a huge reduction from last year, equal to 0.8 times first half EBITDA, and will show a further reduction in the second half. Adjusted EPS, therefore, of 4.3 pence, almost 40% higher than last year, partly due to a lower effective tax rate. On the dividends, and Matt will talk more about this later, we have revised the policy. So the ratio uh, has been doubled up to 40 to 60% uh, of um, after-tax profits will now be paid out as dividends. And this results in a 3.2p dividend, 1.5p is the 2020 interim dividend, and 1.7p is the dividend that we would have paid earlier on this year but was suspended because of the virus. If I could now go on to talk about the virus itself and how we responded to it. Obviously because we own a factory in China we were aware uh, of the problem right from the beginning of February which meant that by the time the lockdown etc happened in the UK we were well placed and we had a plan of what we had to do. Obviously, the primary focus was on employee safety and well-being, but we were able to mitigate the reduction in activity with reductions in overheads in a timely manner. As it turned out, the demand was actually stronger than we were thinking because our share of the online channel and the DIY Okay, well, thank you. Good morning, uh, everyone. Just whilst we wait for John. Um, as John was in the process of saying, actually, demand was stronger than we uh, thought it might be, thanks to our good share of both online and DIY markets, and so much so that the business had returned to growth in the second half. Um, and that allowed us to uh, bring our employees fully back from their initial furlough. So actually, as it turned out, a relatively uh, good outcome at the end of the period. On the operational highlight side of things, we've highlighted before um, the four key things that we're trying to do to improve our business model. New product development has always been a hallmark of Luceco. Uh, that is activity that we've continued despite the constraints of cost constraints of COVID. We realize how important that is to our future. Uh, we've continued to uh, make the necessary changes to our manufacturing capabilities 
capability to lower product costs um, into the both in the past and into the future. And John will talk more about that in the in the second if he if he returns. We've invested in our warehouse capability in the UK to improve service and lower cost. And we've made numerous enhancements to our IT capability, again, to uh, improve service and and lower cost. So I think it's fair to say that progress on those uh, key work streams was inevitably slightly disrupted by COVID in the first half as our attention turned to that. It is progress that we expect to accelerate uh, in in the second half of the year. Okay. All right. So if we now move on to the uh, financial highlights, starting with the income statement. So working from the top down, I think this just sort of slightly uh, re- it goes over the same ground that John was John was covering. So H1 revenue came in at 71.6 million. Uh, that was 13.4% lower than the previous year. Obviously, that outcome was heavily influenced by COVID, uh, but as John alluded to, actually, the outcome was better than we initially expected it to be. The recovery was quicker than we expected it to be, and we were very pleased to see the business return to growth at the start of the second half. I think the really good news is that we managed to offset the effects of that revenue reduction with progress further down the P&L. Most notably, gross margin. So a 3.4% improvement year over year to 38.4% for the half. That represents our fourth successive uh, half of gross margin expansion. And if you add up the progress over that two-year period, uh, it equates to over 1,100 basis points of, of gross margin increase, which is, which is great. And I'll, I'll come to talk about the, uh, the drivers behind that in a second. Suffice to say that we do expect to make further progress uh, in the second half. And I'll, again, I'll, I'll explain the reasons for that also. On the overhead lines, I think in summary, what we did is we made or we viewed all of our overheads as as variable. So therefore, with that mindset, we managed to reduce the overheads by more than the reduction in revenue as a percentage. And that came from acting quickly, having good visibility of the virus from the start, acting decisively, but not doing anything, I believe, that would in any way compromise uh, the future of the business. So no salary cuts, no redundancies, um, you know, and NPD, our new product development activity continued throughout. So the good progress on gross margin and the progress on overheads allowed us to actually grow our operating profit by 25% during COVID to 9 million. And our operating margin percentage ended up in the middle of our previously published range of 10 to 15%, which is not a bad performance considering the, the backdrop. We also managed to reduce the effective tax rate from 23.4% last year to 19.3% for for the first half, really through tax planning, making better use of available tax losses. And all of that put together resulted in an earnings share increase of very nearly 40% to 4.3p. Moving on to the next slide, what I wanted to do here is just give you a sense for what COVID was doing to our activity levels during the half and then into the second half. So what you're seeing there is a daily recalculated assessment of full year revenue, so LTM revenue. Uh, And this is really how we were looking at it and managing it. And it literally had to be managed every day. Uh, during the period. I think the sort of impact of the virus can be divided into three phases. So the first was the first quarter, where COVID was at that stage really for us only impacting China, only impacting supply. And it resulted, as you can see, in a £5 million reduction in annualised revenue. Now, That was obviously a relatively significant impact, but it was an impact that we felt that we could recover in the second quarter if the virus remained in China only. I think, obviously, as we got towards the end of that quarter, it became increasingly apparent that that wouldn't be the outcome. (laughs) And uh, the virus was progressively escaping Chinese borders. So it began to affect demand also in the markets in which we sell. And that effect was more dramatic. So you can see having lost five million pounds of revenue in the first quarter, we lost another five million in the month of April alone. And we prepared the business for really a continuation of that trend. So we had a cost mitigation plan ready to go. We triggered it at the start of April. It reduced our fixed cost base by 40 percent really overnight. 
And I think, you know, that's what we had prepared ourselves to endure. The interesting thing is that April was really as bad as it got. So underneath all of this, whilst there was a, you know, there was an inevitable initial shock, actually retail consumer demand, we feel remained relatively robust throughout. And we were in, in a good position to meet that demand because of our good channel access. So particularly our relationships with online distributors as well as, as hybrid operators as well. So that certainly helped. And it resulted in the end in a decline in revenue slowing to only 10% by the end of the second quarter. If you then roll forward to the second half, you can very clearly see a recovery in annualized revenue. What has driven that? Well, I think demand on the professional side of the business has been a bit slower to, to recover, but it did recover in the second half. So it resumed low single, single digit growth. And we also saw particularly, so we have seen particularly strong demand from consumer channels, some of which we feel is restocking in the channel after having experienced a better than expected Q2. Okay, so that's the impacts of COVID through time. If we go on to the in the next slide, this gives you an idea of the impact of COVID by geography. So the top two charts deal with our UK business. Um, top left, you'll see UK retail, which is our biggest individual you know, part of the business. Um, what you see there is a relatively early impact of COVID. And the reason is, is that we sell to these larger customers on an FOB basis. And that means the customer picks up the products in China which is difficult to do if your own factory is closed and the port is closed and the country is in general lockdown. So you saw a, a relatively impact um, in, that, in that part of the year, or part of the period, should I say. I think the most important part of this chart is what then happened to that part of the business in the second quarter. So a really quite good recovery, much better than we thought. And it goes back to what I said before, good continuing consumer demand which we were well placed to fulfill. And as a result, we feel that we outperformed the market. If you look on the top right, you see almost the mirror image. So relatively little impact on the UK professional channel in the, in the first quarter. The reason being that these customers, whilst there was a supply chain impact for us, these customers were drawing upon our UK inventory and therefore we had a buffer to be able to continue to meet that demand. If you then look into the second quarter, you see a much more meaningful impact. There's probably two reasons for this. So the first is that wholesale networks generally, I think, took a more stern approach to, to lockdown. So they comprehensively locked down their networks and they did so for longer. And these types of customers perhaps don't have quite so developed online, online capability or click and collect capability. So the impact for them of locking down was, was greater. And the second big reason is that organizations inevitably cut back on their commercial capex spend and that affected our led project business i would end that just by saying that whilst the impact in q2 was quite large i'm pleased to report this channel in total had returned to low single digit growth at the start of the second half as they've emerged from lockdown on the bottom half of the chart you can see europe in the bottom left uh, the big reduction that you see in Q2 was really just a function of continental European governments taking a more stringent approach to lockdown than perhaps what was adopted in, in the UK. So uh, quite a big impact. Again, uh, I would just stress that either side of the European lockdown, we actually saw really quite good growth uh, from our businesses there. So no particular cause for concern. And then bottom right, you see the rest of the world. Actually, we delivered growth in this in this geography uh, in the half. Mostly that was a function of areas or regions like the Middle East and countries like Mexico being less affected by COVID than, than other parts of the world. So we could get on with the business of, of selling. OK, moving on to the next slide. This is probably one of the, the more important slides in the deck. So. Obviously, gross margin improvement has been a key feature of the group's recovery over the last two years. And I think the momentum that we had in this area was one of the big things that insulated us from COVID uh, during the first half. This shows you really the, the entirety of that, of that journey over two years. So back in the first half of 2018, 
our gross margin actually was at a historic trough of 27.3%. I think the reasons for that trough were well uh, explained and covered at the time. So we experienced adverse and unhedged movements in in FX and, uh, in, and, in, and in copper prices. And we had not reset selling prices accordingly for various different reasons. I think the initial plan back then was to at least get our gross margin back to its previous peak of 31.9%. I'm pleased to say we, we somewhat overcorrected. Um, so this, this takes you through the chronologically almost the things, the levers that we pull to reconstitute the gross margin. So um, the first would be selling prices. So we put through a sort of an overdue selling price in 2018 in response to those FX and, and copper moves. I think it's important to say that we have not put any further price increases through since then. So none in 2019 none in 2020 and i think that stands as apart from others in the industry so so this gross margin story has not been built upon if you like the backs of our customers uh, far from it in fact so so that's the sort of the selling price story from from the very very beginning of this journey FX and copper, the environment was quite adverse uh, in 2018. It has improved since then, um, as you can see. And the good news is that we have now hedged in at those more favorable rates for the rest of this year and also in large part for next year as well. So, um, so that is something that we are at this stage you know, not, not unduly concerned about. But I think the external factors such as, as that are, are not really the biggest driver of the story. I think at least as important has been what we have done from inside the business to improve the gross margin for ourselves. And in particular, you know, frankly, what we've done is lower the cost of products through either manufacturing efficiency gains or designing lower cost products or um, seeking better sourcing arrangements with suppliers. And I'll come on to speak about those in more detail in a second. So you put that all together, you reach the destination points of 38.4% for the, for the half. I think the interesting thing is to see the, the final red square on the, uh, on the waterfall chart, i.e. Um, the end point was achieved despite actually an adverse sales mix. So in the first half, as I, as I described earlier, we had a relative lack of high margin professional sales. That's a situation that I expect to normalize in the future, starting in the second half. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we expect gross margin to, um, to, uh, to improve uh, as we go through the rest of the year. Moving on to the next slide. So this gives you a bit more detail on how we have achieved the reduction in, in product cost, which has obviously been a key feature of the gross margin story. Um, the top half um, lays out what we've done to the cost of the products that we make ourselves. So if you look at a consistent basket of goods and you normalize for changes in FX and commodity rates, and you just look at pure manufacturing efficiency, um, over two years, what we've done in real terms is reduce the average production cost um, of, by 12.5%, which is obviously very meaningful. The, re the, the way in which that has been achieved has been through a very large number of small actions, which would be impossible for me to cover uh, completely. I I've given you some key things on the, on the right-hand side there. But I would say there's probably two big drivers, two foundational steps. So the first is we hired a new management team. And this management team have spent their careers delivering ever better manufacturing efficiency in relatively low growth environments. Um, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that that team have brought a change in mindset to the rest of the team. Uh, and the mindset now is, is not about capacity expansion, which was probably the story up until 2018. Um, the story now and the focus now is much more on every day eking out ever better manufacturing efficiency and continuous improvement. Um, and you can see the difference that it's that it has made to our production costs. And I think I would like to think there's more to come in this area. Okay, and then on the bottom uh, half of the of the chart, you can see the same thing, but for third party and source products. 
And I've given you some examples on the left, um, particularly in the LED category. So very meaningful reductions in, in third party uh, sourced items. How has this been done? Well, the first step, foundational step, was to start paying our suppliers on time. In fact, this is something that we talked about back in 2018. We, I think our trade creditors uh, at the end of 2017 would double what they are today. So we focused very much on the, you know, the key part of, this, of the supply deal was the terms that could be offered, uh, not necessarily the prices. And that's what we needed to do to fund the business back then. Well, you know, we are now in a very different place. Um, you know, we are paying our suppliers on time. We've turned the debate to uh, to cost, and frankly, we've got more suppliers that we can that we can now speak to as a result of being a um, you know an on time payer. So I think that has been key. Um, a lot of work has been done in redesigning products to take cost out of them. Um, which has been, you know, which has been significant. Uh, and the third thing I would say is that probably in 2017 and in the first part of 2018, we were a bit too precious about making things for ourselves in-house rather than being um, ambivalent about uh, making inside or outside and merely focusing on the economically cheapest way of, uh, of getting our hands on the product. So I think that decision-making process has improved for the, for the better. Okay, <clears throat> moving on to the next slide. Obviously, I mean, the gross margin improvement has been, has been significant and it has been from the outside looking in, I guess, quite dramatic. I'm sure there will be concerns, inevitable concerns, that perhaps this gross margin improvement might reverse at some point in the future. Um, this slide is intended to provide comfort on that. So what I've done here is I've shown you on the left-hand side our mix of business from, from wiring accessories, accessories through to Ross. And for each segment, I have then sought out what kind of gross margin would an average performer in that space deliver? And what kind of gross margin would a top performer in that space deliver? If you then take those benchmarks and you weight it for our mix of business, what it tells you is, is a nothing other than average uh, company doing what we do would make a 36% gross margin. Obviously, we see ourselves as something better than average. A top performer uh, would generate a gross margin in the low 40s. So I think far from you know, suggesting a concern that this gross margin um, might reverse, what it, it gives you comfort that the gross margin we're making is sustainable, perhaps even um, you know, possibly uh, the opportunity to, to improve it in the future. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, I think overheads I won't go through in a, in a lot of detail. As I mentioned at the start, we achieved a 15% reduction uh, year over year. The, the waterfall chart shows you the things that, that we did. I think, again, I would just reinforce what I said before, and that is that we this is a function of acting early, acting stringently, but not compromising the future of the business along the way. Uh, so we were very happy with the outcome for the half. Just as, as one sort of cautionary note, um, you know, we do expect overheads to increase in the second half. Um, it's, it's a good reason rather than the bad reason in as much as the business can now afford to you know, bring all of its people back. It needs to bring all of its people back from temporary layoff. Um, it can afford to pay a bonus and quite rightly so. It will incur additional freight costs on extra products sold. Um, so overheads will increase. Um, I will say that I do not expect them to increase to last year's H2 level, uh, which is 22.6 million. It should remain below that and that will be achieved despite the fact that revenue for that period will be um, higher than last year. So that's, a, I think, a good balance overall. And moving on to the next slide, segmental results. So um, I think the headline here is that um, all of our major segments, and by major, I mean wiring, LED, and portable power, all of those either held or increased their operating profit in the year of, in a period of COVID. Uh, the obviously the only exception is our very smallest segment, Ross, which uh, reduced its profit only very marginally. And actually, I'd expect them to address that in the second half. Um, if you focus on the major segments, um, if you look at those segments where demand was strongest, so wiring accessories and portable power, for wiring, I would say that was a function of us outperforming the market. Uh, largely, there, there were some business wins within that. 
but also it's a function of the um, superior channel access that I uh, referred to earlier. So we outperformed the market in wiring accessories quite handsomely. Portable power, this is another one where the, where the reduction in sales was below the group average. I think this was probably more the market than us in as much as during the lockdown, there was good demand for leads and reels as people worked from home or improved their homes. So it resulted in a, a relatively modest reduction in, um, in, in revenue. On the LED side, the reduction in revenue was a bit bigger. Um, that's simply because you know, it's a quite a commercial, commercially focused part of the business for us. I think the good news is that even though there was a reduction in the top line, um, margin improvement, particularly from uh, product cost savings that I referred to earlier, helped us to actually grow the profit, even though with a reducing top line, which was a good result. Okay, next slide. So moving on to the sort of balance sheet cash flow side of things. So starting with free cash flow, what you can see is another strong and resilient cash performance from, from the group. Um, I think it's helpful to think of, well, why are we able to continually do this? I mean, I would say it's a, it's a function of our business model mostly. So, um, you know, if I were to put it this way, I think, I think we are uh, sufficiently high tech that we can generate and command relatively good gross margins for the products that we sell. Um, the sales are sticky. Um, the barriers to entry are reasonably high in terms of the capital requirement uh, or the brand requirement. Um, so sufficiently high tech to generate good gross margins. And obviously, good gross margins are the key to good cash generation. But we're not so high tech that we then have to take a big chunk of that cash and then continually reinvest it in retooling our factory for new products, retooling our inventory for new products or suffering inventory obs obsolescence risk. So we're in that sort of happy um, medium tech kind of ground, which tends to lead itself to good cash generation. And the second thing I would say is that um, we're actually really not that cyclical. So, OK, we are UK focused, but we are diversified within the UK. And the proof of that is, is what you've seen in the, in the first half of the year. And we're mostly RMI focused as well, which tends to be that little bit less cyclical. So the cash flows tend to be high and relatively predictable. Um, I think the only thing that the business um, really needed to do to bring out this natural cash flow was just be a bit more disciplined around where it chose to grow uh, and also be a bit more disciplined around working capital. And both of those two things have been done uh, over the last two years. And you can see the proof of, of that pudding here. Okay, moving on to the on to the next slide, and of course you can now see what that free cash flow has done um, to our indebtedness. And I, I know this is a slide I've used before, um, but I liked it so much last time I've done it again. So um, over the last two and a half years, we've generated forty eight million pounds worth of free cash that has come in at a roughly, on average, you know, just under twelve percent free cash flow margin, which is great. And that has allowed us to do what needed to be done, and that is eliminate the funding risk uh, from the business uh, from 3.5 times EBITDA at the end of 2017 down to 0.9 times uh, now. So uh, great progress. In fact, so much progress that uh, in the end, we didn't need to proceed with the covenant resets that we talked about uh, last year end because, frankly, they just weren't required. Uh, what we did instead is, ex you know, instead is extend the term of our existing bank facilities through until the end of Q1 2023. So great progress. Um, obviously, I think that then begs the question, with, with the balance sheet, quote unquote, fixed, um, what does one do next uh, with the cash that this business throws off? Um, and you'll see on the next slide what that is. So the first thing we're going to do is to reset the dividend policy to make it more appropriate and, and fair. So the reason for that is shown on the left-hand side of the chart. So again, over that same two and a half year period, the business pre-CapEx has generated free cash flow of 58 million pounds. Using our existing dividend policy, only one pound in every 10 pounds has been has ended up in the ha hands of shareholders. Um, now, I don't feel that's a sustainable place to be. Um, as it happened at the time, it was very useful because it allowed me to get on with the business of deleveraging the business, as, as you've seen on the previous, previous slide. 
but with that, with that now having been done, um, there are two things that we can now do. So the first is to reset the dividend policy. So to increase the payout from 20 to 30% of uh, PAT or uh, adjusted EPS uh, to 40 to 60% of adjusted EPS. We'll, we'll start at 40% uh, for this year. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to pay the 2019 final dividend that we suspended um, at the height of COVID. Um, so that will result in a 3.2p dividend um, declared at interim. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that even after having done that, um, that dividend policy will not get in the way in any way uh, of our growth strategy. So we will continue to be able to fund CapEx appropriately in the business. And we should actually, as you can see from the pie chart, you can we should have lots of free cash still left to do other things, and I would like it if that other thing was 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 M and A. Um, moving on to the, I think my final slide, yeah. So um, balance sheet. I won't go through this in much detail. It's, it's really just a function of uh, the actions I've previously uh, described. Um, I think the standout points on on this slide would be that in real terms, through COVID, <clears throat> we reduced our working capital by 4.5 million pounds, or eight percent. And we did that by very proactively managing inventory. So we started reducing production output and reducing purchasing long before the UK uh, ended up in lockdown. Uh, and we were also we put extra emphasis on uh, debt collection. So during the period we ever managed to avoid any material bad debts, which is which is great. So um, appropriate management of the balance sheet throughout. Um, I think that's it from me, uh, Tams, and I'm hoping that John might now be back online. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, we were determined not to lose this year uh, in terms of progress and all the other areas of the business. New product development, which is an area which historically has driven significant growth throughout the group, has continued as per normal throughout the COVID period. Office Electrics is a new uh, is a new channel and a new whole sort of business area that we're particularly excited about and we're launching a range later on this year this is sort of targeted at commercial offices which unfortunately of course with the covid timing maybe isn't now everyone's focus but when things return to normal there is a whole category of uh, electrics on the desk behind the desk and under the floor which is an area we've not been involved before, which um, seems to be high margin, not very well served, and we believe that we can do some good business in this area. And then there's a list of other products that we've been working on. We've also continued to work, as Matt said earlier, uh, on improving our factory in China. Uh, so basically more automation, more sort of lean manufacturing processes, and ultimately this hopefully will enhance the group margin in the years to come. Other key um, uh, initiatives we've been working on is to improve the customer experience. So we've invested a lot in the warehousing and distribution setups, particularly at our UK warehouse up in Telford, uh, a warehouse management system, um, a demand forecasting and MRP system upgrade, all aimed at enhancing the customer experience such that we have a best-in-class in proposition. We've also been investing in IT enhancements across the group. We had a cyber attack about a month ago, which we were able to handle reasonably well, but as a result of which we are investing in further cyber security um, enhancements. We've also been investing a lot in our product assets, in um, in terms of the digital marketing space, because more and more of our customers are doing more and more transactions online, which means that all of our product marketing efforts have been targeted at improving how our products appear uh, in the digital space. As Matt spoke about earlier, we consider that M&A will be um, a future key driver of the growth as the core business has become highly cash generative. In, in terms of funding capacity, you can see the graph in the top left um, has improved steadily over the last few years. And by the end of this year, 
would be north of about 60 million pounds. Uh, and that is operating within the in the two times maximum leverage ratio. In terms of the priorities, obviously wiring accessories is a very high margin business that we like a lot. However, as you can see on the right hand side, wiring accessory targets in Europe are few and far between. We've actually only identified nine targets, whereas the LED space is probably more likely for um, future acquisitions just because there are so many more appropriate targets meeting our criteria. We would, however, not limit it to only wiring accessory and LED targets. We'll also be looking at product adjacencies um, and or areas where we think we can use our manufacturing expertise in China. Obviously, the more product we can drive through our own factory, the higher the margins we can make. And if we move on to the next slide, which is the current trading and outlook. Current trading is strong. Uh, we have a pretty good idea now of the result for Q3. And we have a strong FOB order book for October and November. The consumer sort of DIY boom, which I spoke about earlier, has been benefiting customers like Amazon, customers like Screwfits, customers like Tool Station, as well as the DIY sheds where we have an extremely strong presence. These higher volumes in the second half will also result in higher margins as we're able to put more volume through our factory. And the great cash conversion will also lead to a further reduction in the leverage ratio. For the full year for 2020, as we have said in the RNS announcement, unless there is further macroeconomic headwinds at the end of the year, we do think we can make significant progress beyond the guidance that we have put in the market. However, there is obviously a huge amount of macro uncertainty as to what may happen towards the end of this year. Into next year, again, the outlook remains uncertain, but we have been successful in picking up some significant new business wins in some of our larger customers. And that with all the internal improvements we can make, which we believe will result in higher gross margins, should mean that we can make further progress next year. Uh, there is, however, uh, a question as to how much demand will be affected as and when people leave their homes and return to work in their offices, and also what the wider economic landscape you know, might look like in the post COVID period. But having said all that, we remain extremely optimistic about the future. And that's the end of the, the formal presentation. I will now hand over to Tamsin to manage any questions. And we'll go to Daniel Cunliffe from Liberum. Daniel, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, good morning, um, gentlemen. Thanks for the question. Um, hi. Um, just just a, two quick ones from, from my side. Firstly, I was interested in the slides on the M&A targets. You talk about um, 10 to 20% of potential acquisitions um, that, that meet your criteria. I think about 10 in wiring and just under 20 in LED. Just to be interested in, in what the, the uh, you know, these, these um, you know, measurements of your criteria um, that sort of involves. I can see it's a ten percent margin, but just just any more colour around that uh, criteria uh, would be uh, useful. And any any types of multiples you, you think is uh, relevant. Um, and then I, I guess just second question, um, John, you, you touched on sort of progress beyond the guidance. Um, uh, we can see that you're heading for a twenty three million, around fifteen percent margins. If you achieve that during COVID, um, 15%, is it fair to assume that the 10 to 15% through cycle um, could well move to the upside once we get more clarity around macro and COVID, et cetera, et cetera? So th those two would be great. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Um, in terms of the acquisition criteria, I mean, obviously, size is a, is a relevant factor. I mean, we're targeting up to 50 million uh, of turnover 
you know, possibly more. We don't, you know, want to bet the house on a single deal. Equally, we don't want to do loads and loads of small deals because the, um, you know, the integration activity takes a lot of management time. So somewhere in the region of sort of 10 to 50 million, we think is our sweet spot in terms of revenue. There aren't that many wiring accessory businesses that are not owned by sort of major multinationals. The likes of Snyder, you know, Legrand, Honeywell, you know, Siemens, Hager. These are the brands and the businesses that own most of the wiring um, accessory activity in Europe. So, you know, the criteria we've got there are businesses that we think are of the right size, but also potentially for sale uh, at some point in the future. Um, and there aren't that many of them. In terms of LED, there are quite a lot more. I mean, there are just lots more LED companies out there. But in terms of quality and defensibility and higher margins, we think wiring accessories is a better place for us to look. In terms of multiples, you asked the question. I mean, we paid we paid six times for uh, for Kingfisher lighting, but that was a relatively small operation. I think um, sort of eight times for um, and um, a project LED business is about right, and up to ten times for um, a wiring accessory business. That's EBITDA. Uh, in terms of operating margins, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think uh, if we're making up to, you know, if 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 we're making close to fifteen percent this year, I think it's likely that, you know, in a normal year we can make higher than that. We don't know where the limit of the gross margin is. I mean, it's not. I mean, I doubt we can get it much higher than sort of early 40s, but we do think we can push it into that region. Um, so that would imply an operating margin, you know, north of 15%. If I can perhaps just uh, add to that, John, I think I think I think that's right. I think at the very least, I would I would say that um, <clears throat> if we can uh, if we can achieve it in the year of COVID, we can get used to life perhaps, um, you know, more towards the top of our existing range than, than the bottom. I think that's the least you could say. Um, just as a word of caution for 2021, and I think we've referred to this in the in the announcement, um, I think the overheads have been really quite low. Some of that, uh, a very small part of that has come from the government furlough scheme. A big part of that has become from the fact that we've had relatively low sales and marketing costs relative to the revenue that we've still been able to generate. So I think there is upside to operating margin, but I think the upside potential for 2021 is perhaps limited because those benefits will naturally reverse as we get into 2021. I mean, sorry, if I can just add, I mean, that would affect the operating margin percentage. It wouldn't affect the operating yes. margin value because, you know, without COVID, we would have made more money this year. We'd have had higher revenue, we'd have had higher overhead, but the higher revenue would have more than um, outstripped um, the benefit from that we've had from lower overhead. So next year, if we have higher revenues because we don't have COVID, as long as the margins remain intact, we will make higher operating margin as an absolute value, maybe not you know, as much of an improvement at the percentage level as obviously Matt was referring to. And now we'll go to Christian Hinderaker from Liberum. Christian, go ahead and ask your question. Yes, good morning, gentlemen. Two from me as well, if that's okay. I guess, firstly, perhaps for Matt, on the impressive 23% wiring margin, up to the basis points year on year, clearly very solid, uh, particularly when benchmarked against peers like the Gron, which is sort of seeing about a 20% margin. Where, do we, where should we think of this? going forward is 23 the peak uh, or sort of you know how should we think about that and then for the second question perhaps John uh, given I think this might be under your auspices slide 10 you've flagged significant product cost savings across a number of your LED ranges and I guess would be grateful for a bit more clarity as to how much more there may be to go for here uh, and indeed whether this is perhaps you know reducing your few counts or continued um, product development that, that you've discussed on the call uh, or perhaps external sourcing measures. Thank you. Yeah, so let me just uh, deal with the first one. Uh, yeah, so you're right. I think our um, wiring accessory operating margin now benchmarks really quite well against some, you know, some, some big players. I think it really, and, and if you think about, well, where did that gross margin improvement uh, come from? Um, obviously, it's subject to the same gross margin waterfall 
benefits that I, I showed earlier, but disproportionately manufacturing savings uh, impact wiring accessories because pretty much all the factory does for us, um, you know, mostly is, is wiring accessories. So there's no doubt there's been a benefit there. Um, and I would, as we've, as we've uh, alluded to, we think there's more manufacturing efficiency gains to be made. We intend to invest to make that happen. Uh, and that would logically come through the wiring accessory uh, segment. So I think there is room for upside. I think it's the same cautionary statements as I made earlier. There were certain things this year that made our that will make our operating margin percentage better, um, and they will present a little bit of a head headwind for all segments in in 2021. But save for that, I think there's more that we can do on wiring accessory um, operating margin in total. Okay, shall I answer the question on the LED? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. I have been kind of thinking for several years now that the sort of LED sort of cost down activity and the price deflation in the market would sort of level off. And yet year on year, we find ways of doing things cheaper. Um, that is partly to do with the chips themselves uh, and the way that we operate the chips and we drive the chips with the um, company electronics. I mean, the key question is not really what are the further savings we can make? The key question is how much of those savings can we hold on to? and how much of those savings do we need to put into the market we've over the last sort of two years we've improved the margin um we've improved the gross margin in the in the lighting business by about 10 percent now that's partly as a result of these um sort of cost down engineering activities but it's also partly as a result of some sort of moving the product range out of the more um, highly commoditized stuff and into the more sort of technical project based stuff um, LED lamps, for example, um, otherwise known as light bulbs. I mean, they've, that has become a highly commoditized area where we can make very little margin. When we first launched um, LED, that was about half of our revenue. Now it's almost nothing. So we've made a major shift within the lighting business away from commodity over to sort of technical project specification based. Uh, and that has driven higher margin. I think that the rate of of the cost savings we can uh, achieve will slow down, and the and the uh, and the deflation in the market will also slow down. We have obviously been able to improve the margin because our cost savings have been ahead of the market deflation, and hopefully we can continue to do that. It's one of the reasons why the LED, you know why the LED business hasn't grown as much as we would have hoped it to have grown. Actually, in the underlying volume terms, it has grown stronger but in terms of the value that you guys see it hasn't because of the market deflation but within that environment we have improved our margins and we'll go to kevin fogarty from numis kevin we're just unmuting you go ahead and ask your question uh, uh morning jen um a couple of questions for me uh, please just firstly uh max uh, thank you for the detail in terms of the margin progression uh, that's been achieved obviously you know, selling price uh, inflation hasn't been a big driver here. But I guess if we think about the sort of post uh, COVID 19 sort of demand recovery, um, et cetera, and, and in terms of what the competition is doing, what do you think the prospects are for some price, selling price inflation creeping in? Um, you know, that, that may sort of impact margins positively as we roll forward. Um, and just Secondly, in terms of M&A, can you help me understand just the, the sort of pace of M&A activity that you're comfortable with, um, you know, bearing in mind the, the balance sheet progress that you've made uh, in recent years, um, just in terms of sort of how quickly um, you see that sort of school with that sort of gearing up uh, as, as you go forward. And uh, just sort of as an add-on in terms of M&A, uh, I guess, you know, if you think about the areas of potential synergy benefits for the system group, I guess wiring accessories is clear, LED is clear, uh, but I just wondered, you know, areas such as security and fire systems, those types of uh, adjacent uh, markets, just how synergistic they might be um, to the group uh, rolling forward. Um, okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, John, I'll just I'll deal with the sort of price in, inflation one, and then perhaps I'll, you can uh, cover the M and A um, side. So, 
Um, sure, I think it's, it's it's fair to say that there there has been um, price increases on the on the professional UK professional uh, side of the business, or at least in the market, um, which we you know we we have not we have not followed, um, and I think it's fairly typical to see a sort of a drumbeat of, of price increases um, you know every year, particularly on that side of the business. So um, we'll have to see how the macroeconomic picture develops we'll have to see in particular what happens to sterling rmb which can sometimes either drive a price increase in the uk market or perhaps delay one um but i think um you know the time is coming where um you know there will there's likely to be a movement on pricing in the in the uk market um in the let's say within the next 12 months um and then john over to you on the MA side yeah, thanks. If I can just add on the on uh, on the pricing, I mean, we would have had a trade price increase in April this year. We didn't because of because of COVID. We were going to then have one in the autumn of this year, and we haven't because of other reasons to do with what's happening in the warehouse, and because our margins are so healthy, um, we thought we'd take the opportunity maybe to grow our share. But we will definitely put in um, a trade price increase um q1 next year i guess we would normally do one every year around that time uh it's not a big activity it would be probably three to four percent and it only affects the uk trade um other pricing it's a sort of ongoing discussion with customers all the time and matt says you know the rmb us dollar exchange rate particularly on the fob business is uh, an important driver as is commodity prices and other factors such as that these results and our higher margins will obviously be seen by our customers so the larger customers having having a price negotiation is harder than the smaller ones who will be impacted by the trade price increase that we would put through next year in terms of the m a um, and the synergies that we may or may not be able to get from other categories i mean obviously wiring accessories is very easy for us we know a lot about making those things uh, LED lighting again. We know quite a lot about ma uh, about manufacturing that, and the biggest synergy I think on any acquisition would be to pick up the products and put them through our own factory. Um, I mean, you're right, Kevin. That in terms of sort of fire and security, the manufacturing synergy might be harder. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible. I mean, the underlying technology, which is probably um, sort of electronics, plastic molding, metal bashing, is probably the same. But certainly in in those other categories, we would have a sales synergy. So, you know, we have a very strong position in the electrical wholesale market in the UK, for example, and we're building strong positions outside of these markets internationally. So if we could if we could find a business which, for example, had a relatively small share in the electrical wholesale market, we could use our relationships to uh, increase that share. So we have a question from Andrew Shepherd Barron from Peel Hunt, who says it's a great set of results. One question, how do you see long-term organic growth and how much of that would come from new product development? So Andrew, um, we've, we've guided previously to uh, total um, growth of between five and 10% for the group through the cycle. Um, and I would see that I would like to think we could achieve something towards the top end of that range uh, rather than the bottom. Uh, and if so, I think it would come sort of 50 50 from um, organic and and uh, M&A um, <clears throat> in terms of NPD. Um, I think there's an interesting uh, section in the last annual report where we highlight how much of our revenue today has come from uh, new product development within the last three years. Uh, suffice to say, it's a very big uh, chunk. Now, some some of that is, um, you know, creating new variants of an existing product rather than range extension. Um, but MPD has always been a key driver uh, of uh, of that organic growth line, um, and I see no reason why that would change into the future. I think it's a key part, and it's the reason why we continue to invest significantly in 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 that part of the business. And thank you. And we have a final question from Christian Hinderaker at Liberum. Christian, we've just unmuted you. Go ahead. Thanks, Samson. Yes, 
Thanks, gents, for taking the follow-up. Uh, can I just ask, Pat, you talk a little bit about, uh, I know you mentioned it, Matt, the sort of barriers to entry in terms of perhaps less so production, but in terms of your distribution structure, I guess, split between your relationships with the, uh, the big box customers taking FOB uh, sales and then also your, your sort of Telford distribution center? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. I think probably the individually most significant um, barrier to entry would be the manufacturing capacity required to, to serve the market. Um, I think the second, probably if anything, slightly bigger um, barrier to entry is, is branding. You should, I mean, I've, I've learned to never underestimate uh, the power of our brands, um, you know, particularly really across the portfolio, but particularly within the wire, wiring, et cetera, accessory category. Um, it, it's very, very hard to convince an electrician to uh, stop installing a socket that is in installed for probably most of his professional life in favour of some no brand that's just arrived on the market. And I've got an electrician here in my house this week, and of course I'm grilling him on all these things, and 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 this is what you find. So brand is very, very important and and sticky. Um, and yes, I think I think the warehouse side of things is. I, it's probably not a big barrier today, but I think it will become a bigger barrier for us in the in the future. And as much as we intend to invest in it to to make sure the the service we provide is kind of unsurpassed uh, in the in the industry. Uh, but the bigger barrier I think today is is as you alluded to is the it's not just the sales force; it's the the relationships that the sales force have with um, long-standing customers, where the customer knows that we are going to be able to deliver what they want, high quality, low failure rate, no customer complaints, uh, and do it repeatedly. And that's a, that's a, that, that trust takes a long time, I can tell you, to, to, to replicate. I would also add that the relationships we have with the likes of Screwfix, B&Q, those guys, are formed over many, many years. I think we've got something like 500 lines within Screwfix. Uh, we've, been, we've been a sole supplier to B&Q in these categories for I don't know, about 15 years. I mean, these relationships are formed over many, many years and they are not easy. Um, and we've had a fantastic track record of maintaining them. So I'd say that was a big barrier to entry for others as well.